143. Study number 143. Everything good to go on the recording, Brother Tim? Everything's good. All right. Song, uh, study 143, we're going to talk about the doctrine of performance. The doctrine of performance. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to study the Word of God. Holy Spirit of God, please give me your power. I ask you for the mind of Christ. Help me as I preach your Word to do so faithfully and truthfully to the context. And Lord, I pray that everything is said will bring honor and glory to your name. I pray for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. If anybody among us needs to be saved or needs to be baptized, please Help them to make those important decisions tonight. And Lord, we'll give you all the glory for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Get your notepapers out and your pen if you'd like to take notes. Number one, the correct definition, the correct definition of the word performance is execution or completion of anything, a doing as the performance of work or an undertaking, the performance of duty, it also means action, deed, and a thing that has been done. That's the correct definition of the word performance. Number two, the incorrect definitions are this, an outward showing instead of from the heart and from inner resolve. The second definition that's incorrect, actions in direct opposition of how one truly is. And then the third definition, again, that is incorrect, is more concerned with looking right instead of being right. You know, three weeks ago, I listened to that podcast of a gentleman that uh, is a pastor of an independent Baptist church, but he, he talked bad about his time when he was at First Baptist in Hammond, Indiana, Hiles Anderson College, and under the ministry of Jack Hiles. Well, he inspired me to preach a, 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 a teach a sermon or doctrine a Bible study um, two two weeks ago, and then as I was thinking about that um, uh, podcast, I came up with a second Bible study last week, and now this is a direct response <laughs> to his griping and complaint. A third Bible study, and uh, what he said on the podcast was he was saying when I was at First Baptist in Hammond, Hiles Anderson College, under the ministry of Jack Hiles. Everybody was concerned about performing and not actually getting close to God and a relationship with God and true Christianity. He, in fact, he said, I didn't know what true Christianity was while I was there. I mean, that's what he said. And I'm just like, man, I just like, oh, I just, I, and this is a big name guy. And like I said, if I had told you his name, those of you that have been to Hiles Anderson or First Baptist in Hammond, you'd definitely at least know who he was and is. And, um, and boy, that just, it just rubbed me the wrong way. How he said at that church, at that college, at that ministry, under the influence of that pastor, people were performing but it wasn't genuine, it wasn't legitimate. And, um, and so I just, I, it just rubbed me the wrong way and it, it offended my spirit in, 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 in a way that I have to respond. So the word performance, he said people were performing, but they weren't genuinely walking with God. And, and so again, the incorrect definition of the word performance is being more concerned with looking right instead of being right. In our day and age, people will say, don't perform as a Christian, you know? But the Bible, however, says we're supposed to perform as a Christian. In fact, the 1828 Webster's Dictionary has, are you listening, has nothing to say about um, uh, concerned with looking right but not being right, or you're acting one way but in your heart you're directly the opposite. Those words are hypocritical. Those words are fake. Those words are uh, maybe, or, or the appropriate word would be, um, maybe, maybe you're a, 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 the Bible called them Pharisees and Sadducees, and we're going to look at a few of those verses in just a few moments. But Pharisaical, that would be a term that would be appropriate. But to, but to say you're not supposed to perform as a Christian is wrong. The Bible tells us 
we're supposed to perform. And again, the correct definition is an execution or completion of anything, a doing as the performance of work or an undertaking, the performance of a duty. It's an action, a deed, or a thing done. Now, that is the biblical definition of the word performance. And so every one of us that are Christians, every one of us that love the Lord, we need to understand God expects us to perform. And I'm gonna talk to you in great detail about it tonight. Number three, a form of the word performance appears in 69 verses in the Bible. 69 verses in the Bible. And I looked at every single one of those verses in preparing this Bible study. The word performance is found in five different forms in the Bible as far as performed, performing, performance, perform, and, and there's another one. But uh, there are 69 verses in the Bible that deal with the, the subject matter of the word performance. All right, number four. These verses do not correctly apply to performance. The verses I'm about to read to you, these verses do not correctly apply to the, to the word performance. Here we go, Matthew 23, verses 25 through 28. It says this, "'Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, "'for ye make clean the outside of the cup "'and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion, an excess thou blind pharisee cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter that the outside of them may be clean also woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye are like unto whited sepulchers which indeed appear beautiful outward but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Okay, what is the correct term that's used for this passage? It's the word hypocrite. That's the correct term. In fact, Jesus used it when he was talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. He says, you're a hypocrite if you're concerned with cleaning up the outward of your life, the outward appearance, and yet the inward part of you, the heart and the soul, and your mind is filthy and dirty and wretched. He said, clean the inside out first and then work on the outside. But the word is not performance. He didn't chide these uh, people, the Pharisees and Sadducees. He didn't say, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, performers. He didn't say that. He said, hypocrites. Let's look at another verse, Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. It says, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision that is of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Okay, we live in a day and age where the Jews, by and large, not 100% of them, but an overwhelming majority of them have rejected Jesus Christ as their as the Messiah. I was out soul winning today, and I went over to uh, Roosevelt Park, and um, when, um, in fact, I was just leaving there as I saw you on your bike, Manuel, um, and so, and, uh, but I was, I was at the park, and, um, and, and I met a Jew, and so I asked him, you know, I gave him a track, he took it. So I said, there's different types of Jews, there's Orthodox Jew, there's Reformed Jews, there's uh, Messianic Jews, I said, what are you? He goes, I'm a conservative Jew, I said, okay. So I said, so as a conservative Jew, he said, watch this now. I said to him, do you believe the Old Testament is good and true, but the New Testament is not true? He said, that's exactly correct. He goes, now I know some Messianic Jews. I said, really? He said, yes. He goes, the Messianic Jews believe that Jesus is the Messiah and they, have, they, 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 they trust in him as their savior. And he said, if a Jew does that, he says, they're not a Jew anymore. He said, because Jews, he said to me, do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but we believe there's a Messiah yet to come in the future, and we are waiting for him. Okay? So, again, he doesn't speak for all Jews, but generally speaking, that's the consensus 
of Jews. Now watch this. God says in verse 28, he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. That means genetically. That means of the flesh. That means they have a lineage relating back to a Jewish family. Okay? That's what God says. Neither is the circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Now, listen to this carefully. All the Jews that are not saved, they do not believe. Are you listening? They do not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. God says they're not a Jew because they're not one inwardly. All these people that are, you know, um, uh, pro-Israel, pro-Jews, I think we're confused. Are you listening? As Christians, we're confused. A Jew, according to the Bible, is a person who has inward faith in Christ. And, and the Bible says they're, they're part of the lineage of the seed of Abraham. I'm going to tell you this right now. The seed of Abraham is the, is the, is the promised seed. The seed of Abraham is, has been given the promise where God said, back in the book of Genesis, I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. That was not given to the nation of Israel. That was given to the seed of Abraham. Now listen carefully. In the Old Testament, the seed of Abraham did believe in the coming Messiah. They were the people of God, the chosen people, if you please. And for a period of time, they did live in the geographical area that is called Israel. Now, when they rejected Christ as their Savior, as the Messiah, Jesus pronounced to them when he was here before he was crucified. He goes, I am taking the kingdom of God away from you, and I'm going to give it to a nation, bringing forth fruits thereof. Again, we're talking about people who are inward in their faith instead of outward and just in their physical beings, right? So here's what God says. This is not, by the way, talking about performance. This is not talking about performance. So for someone to say, well, you're, you know, you're outwardly what you're supposed to be, but you're not inwardly what you're supposed to be, that has nothing to do with the word performance, okay? So right here, God says you're not a Jew if you're just outwardly a Jew. You are a Jew if you're one inwardly, the circumcision of the heart. And it says, in the spirit and on the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And so, and again, that's in receiving Christ as the Messiah. Matthew 6, verses 1 through 5. It says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet. Dun, 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 look what I'm about to do. He says, don't do that. He says, to be seen of men. Otherwise ye have, uh, I'm sorry, uh, sound the trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. For verily I say unto you, they have have their reward. But when thou dost doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. Now, verses 16 through 18. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. All right, Matthew chapter 6 is not dealing with performance. It is dealing with motives. Motives. God is saying, why are you doing what you're doing? So people can brag on you? So they can <laughs> applaud you? He goes, if that's what your motive is, here's what he said, you've got your reward. You ain't getting a reward from me. But he said, if you'll do what you do, not to be seen of men, but it's secretive in your heart. He says, I'll reward you in heaven because your motive is pure. So again, this has nothing to do with performance. Uh, and, that, and, that, um, and that podcast, 
He was saying, yeah, people were trying to bring visitors to church to win prizes and a promotion. And people were, you know, doing certain things just because everybody else would notice them and all this stuff. Well, first of all, you know, he's judging their motives and he doesn't know what their motives are. You know, someone may be participating in bringing visitors to church because they just love people and want people to get saved, you know. And uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, that has nothing to do with performance now if you do what you do so people can brag on you what you did is still good it's like if you led someone to the lord and you want people to know about it so they'll brag on you well that the person's still saved amen but you don't get any reward when you get to heaven because that's what your reward is your motive was not pure but if you have a pure motive then god will reward you for all that you do for him when you get to heaven now again nothing to do with the doctrine of performance, okay? But people misapply that. You know, people have said, you shouldn't perform when you go to church. Um, according to the Bible, you should. You shouldn't perform as a Christian. According to the Bible, you should. Now let's take a look at all of those verses right now, okay? Number five, God performs what he says. God Fill in the blanks as we go. God performs what he says. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 45. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. You know what? Um, uh, uh, Elizabeth said, blessed is she that believed. He said, because God's going to perform what he told you he would do. You see, God performs. Jeremiah 23, 20, the anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart in the latter days. Ye shall consider it perfectly. Guess what God not only performs? He performs what he says. He performs his thoughts. Let's continue. Jeremiah 30, verse 24, the fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it and until he have performed the intentions of of his heart in the latter days ye shall consider it what does god perform he performs what he says he performs his thoughts he performs the intentions of his heart and then lastly jeremiah 33 verse 14 behold the days come saith the lord that i will perform that good thing which i have promised unto the house of israel and to the house of judah what else does god perform are you listening he performs promises he performs his promises. So if you're sitting here thinking to yourself, I wonder if God will perform what he said. The answer is yes. I wonder if you may be thinking, I wonder if God perform what he thinks, his thoughts. The answer is yes. I wonder if God performs the intentions of his heart. The answer is yes. And then you look at the promises of God's word. Are you listening? And you say, I wonder. Does God still perform his promises in 2024? The answer is yes. He'll perform it all. Why? Because God to him, the word perform is not a bad word. It's who God is and what he does. And we need to be like him. Number six, turn the page over if you haven't already. Number six, we should perform what we say. Again, fill in the blanks. We should perform what we say look at deuteronomy 23 verse 21 this is the law by the way deuteronomy 23 21 when thou shalt vow a vow unto the lord thy god thou shalt not slack to pay it for the lord thy god will surely require it of thee and it would be sin in thee but if thou shalt forbear to vow it shall be no sin in thee that which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt keep and perform even a free will offering according as thou hast vowed unto the lord thy god which thou hast promised with thy mouth okay god says if you made a vow to him, if you've promised anything to him, God says, keep your word. Keep your, this is the law. This is the law. God says, keep your vows and your promises to me. Now, let's go to the New Testament. Now, ready? Now, wait a second. I can, I can already tell some of you are thinking about what Matthew 5 says, right? Let's look at it. Let's look at it. 
Matthew 5, 33 through 37, ready? Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thy oaths. Okay, we just read it in Deuteronomy, right? We just read it. Now let's continue. Verse 34, Jesus is speaking. Ready? But I say unto you, here we go. What does Jesus say unto us? Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. Now look at verse 37. But, ready? Let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Now, listen to me carefully now. When you speak, okay, Jesus referenced the Old Testament. And he says, been written of old that you, you should perform all that you have, all your oaths, all your vows, all your promises to God. That's what he said. He said this, but I say unto you, don't swear or promise by heaven, by the earth, by Jerusalem, or even by the hair of your head. You know what he was saying is, don't make a promise and say, I promise you by all the hair that's on my head, this is, I promise you by heaven, this is what I'm going to do. God says, don't swear by anything at all. You ready for this? Here's what he says. But let your communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay. Now here's what this means. He says, if you say you're going to do something, do it. If you say you're not going to do something, don't do it. Here's what Jesus said. Don't make it so that you have to promise you're going to do something. Just simply say what you're going to do and do it and say what you're not going to do and don't do it. So you know what Jesus said now? He says, I'm not going to hold you accountable to what you promise. He says, I'm going to hold you accountable to what comes out of your mouth. Amen. I've had people say to me in, uh, in the church in the 30 years I've been pastoring, people have said to me, the Bible says in the New Testament you're not supposed to swear by anything. I said, you're right. That's what Jesus said. But guess what he does say? You don't have to swear. Whatever you say you're going to do, do it. You don't have to say, I promise, pastor, I'm going to do this. No, don't say, I promise. He said this, if you say, pastor, I'm going to do this, then do it. Pastor, I'm not going to do this, then don't do it. That's as simple as that. In the Old Testament, watch this carefully. Everything in the Old Testament, there's a law for how God wants us to behave. In the New Testament, Jesus did not destroy the law. He enhanced it. He went further down the road than the law did. I'll give you three examples. In the Old Testament, the law says don't commit adultery. In the New Testament, Jesus said, don't lust in your heart over a woman. That means you've committed adultery in your heart. You know what I'm talking about, right? So guess what? The Old Testament said nothing about your heart. It only said about your actions. The second example, the Old Testament said, don't murder anybody. That's an action. The New Testament, Jesus said, don't hate your brother in your heart without a cause because if you do you've murdered him in your heart that's your in that's your heart your intention your thoughts so in the old testament by the way jesus never said the law is no longer valid you can commit adultery you can you know under the age of grace you can commit adultery you can murder no he doesn't he said i'm going to take the law and i'm going to go further down the road and expect more of you in the age of grace so this example is, in the Old Testament, it says if you make a, an oath or a vow or a promise to God, keep it. Jesus said, whatever you say, whether it's a promise or not, do what you say. And that's basically enhancing it. So guess what God says? We should perform what we say. So if you say you're going to read your Bible, do it. If you say you're going to tithe, do it. If you say you're going to go to church, do it. If you say you're no longer going to drink alcohol, don't do it. If you say you're no longer going to cuss, don't ever cuss again. Whatever you say out of your mouth, I will do this. I won't do this. God says, I don't care if you say, I promise I'll do this, or I promise I won't do this, or not. 
whatever you say, let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. In other words, do what you say. God expects us to perform what we say. Number seven, perform all things according to the Bible. Perform all things according to the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 106, I have sworn and I will perform it, ready, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Where are God's righteous judgments found? In the Bible. So the psalmist said, I'll perform it. Then Luke chapter 2, verse 39, and when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. This is Mary and Joseph in the New Testament. Not in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Mary and Joseph raised Jesus. And how did they do that? They raised him by performing all things according to the law of the Lord. What should we perform as Christians? Everything that this book tells us to do. Let's perform all things according to the Bible. Let this be our standard of how we live. Amen? Number eight. Perform daily what you should do. Perform daily what you should do. Psalm 61, verse number 8. Look what the psalmist said. So I will sing praise unto thy name forever that I may daily perform my vows. Now listen, listen carefully now. I have long preached this for all the years I've been the pastor of this church. Christianity is, was not meant by God to be a weekly function. Christianity was meant by God to be a daily function. You shouldn't just be a Christian on Sundays. You shouldn't just go to church once a week or let it be a weekly time that you read your Bible, a weekly time that you do whatever, and then the rest of the week you're doing whatever you want to do. The psalmist said, it said that I may daily perform my vows. Listen this carefully. Tomorrow's Thursday. You know what God expects you to do on Thursday? To act like a Christian to daily perform your vows. You know, we have this mentality in America that you can live Monday through Saturday, whatever you want to do, and then come to God's house on Sunday and confess your sins and get right with God. And then Monday through Saturday, you can do whatever you want and make all the sins that you want to commit. And then on Sunday, you come and you confess and everything's going to be okay. We in America, we have the idea that our Christianity is a one day a week thing. And God says it should be a daily thing. Daily perform your vows or perform daily what you should do. Number nine, performance begins in the heart. Performance begins in the heart. Psalm 119 verse 112, I have inclined mine heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. Okay, why was the psalmist going to perform God's word, his statutes, all the way to the end? because he has inclined his heart to do that. How many of you have ever gone skiing? Raise your hand, you've gone skiing. I've gone a time or two, I, I just, not for me. Not for me. I didn't have a good experience when I was a teenager. I went skiing and, and nobody told me to cut my toenails. When you go skiing, you need to cut your toenails. I didn't do it. So I got these ski boots and I put them on, and I rented some skis, and I skied as best I could. I did mostly falling down and sliding down the mountain as opposed to skiing down the mountain. I was a teenager. must have been 15 or so. I can't remember my exact age. But at any rate, five, six, whatever, seven hours on the hillside. And my feet were frozen. They were frozen. I came back to the, the rental. I took off my you know ski boots and the, turned in the skis and the and the ski poles and all that stuff. And I took off my right boot and my sock was filled with blood. And it was stuck to my big toe. Well, I had some, you know, toenails on my big toe that were a little bit too long at the time. And, uh, and, and, and it got hurt while I was skiing and I didn't, my foot was frozen. I couldn't feel it until later. And boy, did it hurt later. Oh, my soul, that throbbing and everything. And I smashed my toenail somehow in that boot. Now, um, so I haven't gone skiing much since then. So at any rate, some of you like to go skiing, but you know what it means to incline while you're skiing. You know what I'm talking about? Well, God says you should incline your heart. To what? 
It says, I have inclined mine heart to perform thy statutes alway. Here's what this means. Here's the word of God. This is the statutes of God. You know what God says you should do in your heart? Lean toward the Bible. Don't lean away from the Bible. You live your life leaning toward the Bible. So in other words, you know, I had someone say to me this years ago, years ago, someone said, when I first came pastor, you know, I'm preaching about, you know, what the Bible says, how we're supposed to live and stuff like that. I had this guy come up to me after the service one time and said, show me in the Bible where it says thou shalt not smoke cigarettes. Show me where it says it. And I said to him, can't find it. Cigarettes weren't invented yet. I said, but I'll, I'll tell you this. Show me in the Bible where it says to smoke cigarettes. You see, which way are you leaning? Are you leaning away from the Bible? Well, if it doesn't say I can't watch internet pornography, uh, excuse me, internet pornography wasn't invented back in the time the Bible was written, right? So, well, it doesn't say I can't, whatever. no, no. You ought to lean to the Bible saying, show me in the Bible where it says what I'm about to do is okay. Instead of saying, show me in the Bible where it says, you know, it, it's not okay, right? So it depends on your heart. Are you leaning toward the Bible or are you leaning away from the Bible? A lot of Christians have the mentality they want to do whatever they can get away with. If it's not specifically mentioned in the Bible, then they're going to do it. Even if the Holy Ghost has told them they shouldn't do it. Even if there are verses in the Bible that give us principles about it, you know, um, yet they're going to lean away. Listen, don't live that way. If you want to perform what God wants you to perform, it begins with the condition of your heart. I would highly recommend that you lean toward the Bible. Watch this carefully. I'll give you an example. In the Bible, the Bible says we should go to church. It doesn't say exactly how many times we're supposed to go to church. And I'd like to say this, you need to go at least once a week in order to fulfill the command of God to go to church. But in this church, we have four services a week. Watch this carefully. Show me in the Bible where it says I'm supposed to go to church on Wednesday night. Well, I, I can't show you that. But I can show you where God says, go to church. So you know what that means? You should be leaning in that direction instead of leaning away in a different direction. In other words, hey, you think God's upset with you if you go to church four times this week? Is God up in heaven saying, man, oh, Bill, uh, Bill, what are you doing going to church four times a week? I only wanted you to go once. <laughs> you think that's what God's going to say? No. God's going to look at Bill and say, I, I command you to go to church, but you went above and beyond. You went four times. And that's going to put a smile on God's face. And again, watch this carefully. Which direction are you leaning? Are you leaning away from the Bible? Or are you leaning to the Bible? You know, when it comes to tithing, I've, I've never had anybody say to me, I don't think tithing is in the New Testament. But I give a lot more than 10% when I give. I've never had anybody say that. 100% of the people without fail, the people that I have spoken to, who have said, I don't believe tithing is in the New Testament. They don't even give, what, 2, 3, maybe 4%. They don't even come close to 10%. You know what? Let's suppose God only wanted us to give 10% and nothing more. But my wife and I, for years, we've been giving 30, 35% of all of our increase to the Lord. And that's how we live. I don't think God's going to get, I'm not, we're not going to get to heaven and God's going to say, man, you gave too much. You gave way too much to the church. I'm so disappointed in you. <laughs> you know, I'm leaning on the safe side. I want to lean my heart to the Bible instead of lean away from the Bible. Next, number 10, know your limits. Write that down. Know your limits. You cannot perform what you cannot do. Look what it says in Exodus 18, 18. Uh, Jethro, Moses' mother-in-law, was speaking to him in this verse. Jethro said to Moses, Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for the thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. How many of you have lifted weights in your years of life? You've lifted weights. Have you ever tried to... Brother David, I noticed you didn't lift your hand. You don't, you don't believe in it. Is that what? What? 
I <laughs> don't need to. <laughs> All right. You know, he just, uh, he just gets angry and he turns green. And then he becomes this massive hulk of strength. But anyway, uh, but the fact of the matter is, have you ever tried to lift weights that were too heavy for you to lift and you couldn't do it? Amen. All right. So here's what God is saying. Moses, what you're trying to do, you're not capable of performing. It's too heavy. So there are things that we need to know our limits, right? We need to know our limits. Some of us are capable of doing more than others. And if we're capable of doing more, okay, do more. Some of us are not capable of more, so we should just do what we're capable of doing. Now watch this carefully. This is the essence where God says, don't compare yourself among yourselves. Don't compare yourself. I can go soul winning every single day of the week, every day of the week, and I do. Uh, today I went soul winning. I went over to um, Collier Park on uh, Long's Peak and Collier, and I saw this gentleman sitting down at a picnic table, and I approached him. He's from Texas. He just came into town about three months ago. I struck up a conversation with him. And I asked him, I said, have you been to church much? And he goes, Mormon and Catholic. I said, wonderful combination. I'm telling you what, man. Mormon and then Catholic. Those are some extremes. I mean, come on, they're polar opposites kind of of each other. I said, that's okay. I said, I'm a Baptist preacher. And uh, I said, let me tell you my testimony. And I told him how I got saved. And I said to him, I said, has anybody ever showed you these verses before about how to know for sure you're going to heaven? He goes, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever seen those verses. And he asked me to pray for him about a couple things. And I said, can I show you the verses before I pray with you? And he said, sure. So I showed him the verses. Wouldn't you know it? He got saved. Woohoo! He was so happy. I mean, like, he was so happy. Nobody, and I said to him before we prayed, I said, has anybody ever showed you these verses before? and explain to you how to be saved like I just explained it to you. And he goes, no. I said, does it make sense to you or do you have questions? He goes, no, it makes sense. I said, would you like to ask Jesus to save you? He goes, yeah. So we prayed together and he got saved. I do that every day, every day of my life, every single day of my life. I'm gonna find someone to pray with about their salvation. Now, wait a second. Some of you can't do that every day. You can't. Guess what? You can at least go once a week, though. For someone here to say, I can never go soul winning, that's not right because God's word tells us to go. It literally says in the Bible, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It literally tells us to be soul winners in the Bible. Now, how much? How much are we supposed to be? Well, some of us can do more than others. You ready? But all of us can be soul winners. For you to say, I don't have enough time in the day to go soul. Yes, you do. You got to earn the week. You got 168 hours in a week. I promise you, you can find a, a 60 minute window. You can find a 60 minute window to go soul. You're not that busy. You say, but I am. Then you're too busy. Cut something out of your life. Include soul winning in your life. Okay. So here's what I'm saying though. You don't have to feel pressure to go soul winning every day. But you do need to be a soul winner, okay? Now, some of you are not capable of going soul winning every day. So God says, the thing is too heavy for you. Don't try to do that. He said, but you're supposed to do what you can do. And so Moses was counseling the people from sunup till sundown. We're talking 12 to 14 hours, maybe 15 hours a day. He was counseling people. And Jethro said, hey, man, you're going to wear yourself out. You cannot do this. You need to designate people to help you to be counselors, to help in the smaller matters, and then you can do the major matters. But you've got to free yourself up because if you do 12, 14, 15 hours in a row every day of counseling, you're not going to make it. You're going to wear out. And so he said, you're not able to perform it. Know your limits. Next, number 11. It is grievous to God and to man to not perform what is right. It is grievous to God and man to not perform 
what is right. First Samuel 15, verses 10 and 11. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. You know, if you want to grieve someone or God, don't perform what is right to do. Saul was the first king in Israel. If anybody was supposed to perform the commandments of God, it was the king. He didn't do it. God said, Psh, I wish I would have never made Saul king. Samuel anointed Saul to be king. And it grieved Samuel at his heart because Saul did not perform the commandments of God. Listen to me carefully. It is grievous to God and to man for someone to not perform what is right. Whenever you disobey God, you're not, you're not doing right. If God commands you to do something, just obey him. Whenever you, by the way, I've said this before, and I'll say it till the day I die. God will never command you to do that which you cannot do. If God commands you to do something, it's because you can do it. And if you don't, it grieves God. And then it grieves man. Number, th number 12, look what Saul did after he disobeyed God. Number 12, never lie, cover up, or blame others for your lack of performance. Never lie, cover up, or blame others for your lack of performance. Okay, now watch this carefully. Here's the context. God just came to Samuel and said, I wish I would have never made Saul king because he doesn't obey me. Samuel stayed up all night grieving and crying over Saul. He didn't even sleep one minute. He stayed up all night grieving. And now the next day, Samuel came to see, comes to see Saul. Now watch this. 1 Samuel 15, verses 12 through, we're going to read all the way down to verse number 28. Here we go. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel. And behold, he set him up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. Ready? Here's, Samuel. Here's Saul speaking. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. <laughs> and Samuel said, What meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen? which I hear. Now, time out for a second. God told Samuel, or told Saul, go to the Amalekites and wipe them out. Every person, all the animals, wipe them all out. Why? Because the Amalekites were wicked and they hurt the people of God. And God said, if you curse the people of God, I'm going to curse you. And if you, you know, are an abomination to me, then I'm executing judgment. So God said, I am wiping out the Amalekites. I don't want any of them left, and I don't want any of their animals left. Kill them all. That's what he told Saul. So Saul comes back to Samuel and said, I've obeyed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel goes, I hear all this sheep. I see all this oxen. What are you talking about? Now, let's continue. Verse 15. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. They have brought them, not him. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Wait a second. God didn't want to sacrifice. He wanted them all destroyed. But let's continue. Um, verse 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord set thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king uh, uh, of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed <laughs> the Amalekites. Now, now here's Saul. I killed them all but one. 
<laughs> I saved the king. Watch this now. And Saul said to Samuel, uh, we already read that, verse 21. But the people took the spoil. Again, casting blame. Sheep and oxen. Do you think those people would have done anything the king told them not to do? He's the king. They wouldn't have disobeyed him. Right. But the people took the spoil, the sheep, the oxen, the chief of the things, which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. And thy words, because I, here's his excuse, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, does anybody know anything about the history of Saul in the, in the Old Testament? He didn't fear anybody. He was a ruthless leader. He was trying to kill David for a long time. He didn't fear anybody, yet here he is lying, making excuses. Look at verse 25. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. That means he, Saul grabbed Samuel's uh, uh, trench coat and ripped it off. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Wow. So here's Saul. God gave him clear command. He didn't perform it. And afterwards he said, I have performed it. Excuse me. That's a lie. But the people, you know, he tried to cover it up. Well, we kept the, all these animals alive so that we can sacrifice unto your God. We're performing a sacrifice unto your God, Samuel. And then he blamed the people. Well, uh, I was afraid of the people. They wouldn't listen to me. All of that because he didn't perform what God told him. You know what would have been better for Saul? If he would have just owned it. Just own it. I blew it. You remember when King David committed adultery with Bathsheba, tried to cover it up, had Uriah killed, took Bathsheba to be his wife, and then he went about his merry way? Well, Nathan the prophet came and preached a one-person sermon. And he preached to David and said, David, you are the man. You took Bathsheba from Uriah. God is going to kill you. That's what Nathan said to David. You remember what David said? I'm guilty. I did wrong. I'm sorry, God. I sinned and did this evil in your sight. You know what God did? He spared David's life. He got right with God because he owned it. Saul just made excuses. You know, when you don't perform what God tells you to do, it'd be better for you to just simply own it. Stop making excuses. Why well, didn't go to church because this? Why well, didn't tithe because this? Why well, didn't go so on? I didn't read my Bible. I didn't do what God told me to do because I've got an excuse or because other people's at fault. Or because I had good intentions to do something else. No, no, no. Own it. If God told you to do something and you didn't perform it, it's okay if you own it. That's what it means to confess. God will forgive you. But as long as you're in denial, trying to lie, cover it up, and blame others, it ain't going to make God happy. Number 13. We're almost done. Come to God's house with a willingness to perform what is written in the Word of God. Come to God's house with a willingness to perform what is written in the Word of God. 2 Kings 23, verses 2 and 3, it says, And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before God to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. 
And all the people stood to the covenant. Here's the king bringing in a national revival to Israel. And it started in the house of God with the word of God. The king said, all you people in Israel, you come with me to the house of God. We're going to let the priest read this book right now and tell us what the Bible has to say. And the priest stood up and read the Bible. And guess what he said? We're performing it, all of it. All of us together, we're going to perform what's written in the Word of God. You know, it'd be a good idea for you to come to church every time you come to church. And you say, Lord, whatever the Bible says, you speak to my heart, I'll perform it. Don't come to church just to put in an hour. Come to church hungry to learn what the Bible says so that you can perform it. Number 14. Put away any hindrances that will interfere with your performing what God wants. Number 14, put away any hindrances that will interfere with you performing what God wants. 2 Kings 23, this is again the national revival. It's the same chapter. 2 Kings 23, 24, moreover the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. You know what he did? He did some spiritual house cleaning. He, he put away anything that would hinder the nation of Israel from performing the words of the Bible. It says he put away familiar spirits, wizards, images, idols, and all the abominations that were found out. We spied and found them all. Look at all these abominations. You know what he said? Get rid of them all so that we can perform the word of the Lord. You know, there are things in this world that will hinder you from performing what God's word says. You ought to do some spiritual house cleaning and get them out of your life. Just get them out of your life. Number 15, the flesh will get in the way of our performing what God wants. The flesh will get in the way of performing what God wants. Romans 7, verses 14 through 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. This is Paul speaking, by the way. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity, the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God. Through Jesus Christ our, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. You know what the flesh is trying to do? Your flesh is trying to get in the way of you doing what God wants you to do. But with Jesus Christ, you can get victory. You can. You don't have to just say, well, my flesh wants to do this. The Bible says, I, <laughs> who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know what? The Bible does say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So who do you lean on the most, your flesh or Jesus? If you lean on Jesus, he'll help you to overcome your flesh. If you lean on your flesh, you're going to be too weak to do what God wants you to do. Number 16 and last. Woohoo! We made it all the way to the end. Praise God, Brother Mike. Praise God. God will finish what he has started in us. God will finish what he has started in us. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, look at it, look at it, will perform it 
until the day of Jesus Christ. Romans 4, verses 20 and 21. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he, that's God, had promised, he, God, was able also to perform. You know what God says? I will finish what I start in you. If I saved your soul, you will make it to heaven. You will get a glorified body. And everything for all eternity is going to be awesome and wonderful because God never starts something and then doesn't perform it. He will finish what he started in us. Listen to me very carefully and I'll be done. Your day is coming that you'll get to be in heaven one day. Don't know when. But when that day comes, if you're saved, God's not going to let your soul ever go to hell. And not only will your soul go to heaven, but when you get there, God's going to give you a glorified body. And you'll never have to live with this flesh ever again. Oh, praise God. I said, I said Sunday, my glorified body's going to have hair. I took a picture today of me and that guy from uh, Texas. His name was John. I led him to Christ. I got a picture with him. And I looked at the picture, and I couldn't see any hair on top of my cotton-picking, corn-pulling, pea-splitting head. The sun was just at the right angle, and my hair is so thin up there, it looked like I was completely bald, like Brother Bill. <laughs> I was looking at that. I'm like, what in the world? Where'd my hair go? When I get to heaven, when I get to heaven, glorified body. Man, I'm going to have so much wavy hair up there on top, man. It's going to be awesome. God will perform in us what he started. He is more than capable of performing what he promised. Now, thank God we have a God that performs. Let's make sure we do as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you for each and every person that took time to come to church tonight. Thank you for those who are watching online. Dear God, please, if you spoke to our hearts, help us to perform what it is you spoke to us about, understanding that we are supposed to perform as Christians. Everything that I said tonight, performing is a good thing, not a bad thing. Nothing of which we should be critical or judgmental. Help us to perform what you expect us to do and help us to live our lives performing the word of God. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're gonna have a brief invitation. If God spoke to your heart tonight about something specific in the Bible study about performing, and you would like me to pray for you about it, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if God spoke to your heart and you want me to pray for you about it, would you raise your hand? Preacher, God spoke to my heart. He spoke to my heart. Many, many hands. Wonderful. You can lower your hands. Heavenly Father, you see all the hands that were raised. I don't know how you spoke to them individually. They just simply acknowledged that you did. Father, please help them. Bless them. If they perform what it is you spoke to them about, please bless them for doing so. And help us all to be resolved that we're going to perform like you want us to in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. The pianist will play. God spoke to your heart.